No, this is going to be an experiment. Uh, it's January 2022, and I am preparing for a workshop on the current January topic, which is Patrick Lecture 32, Decision Making. And as part of that, the feedback that I got from um, participants was that they would rather have more exercises during the workshop than teaching. However, there is a certain amount of teaching that needs to be done to make the exercises work, uh, to, to, to fill them out so that they're understood. So what I decided to do was bring the PowerPoint presentation that I use for workshops into this video introduction to Patrick Lecture 32. Now I got carried away and there's a lot more material in this introduction than you may need to get an idea of what Patrick Lecture 32 is about. Keep in mind that I'm differentiating the experiential exercises, which I'm not gonna go into, from teaching basics, teaching perspectives, teaching ways of looking at things. Uh, so I'm gonna be using the PowerPoint and I'm a little clumsy with this sometimes, so I'm gonna do the best I can. Uh, once again, there's gonna be a lot of material in this that is in excess of Patrick Lecture 32. I don't normally like to do that in the video uh, introductions and presentations. I like to uh, try to make as clean a line as possible between how I teach the materials versus what the materials are. Uh, so there's going to be a little interweaving here, a little intermixing. So if you'll bear with me, uh, if you can see subtitles, that's because Zoom now allows subtitles and they're pretty good. So I try to turn them on uh, for the meetings because I can download them and offer them to people uh, if they need them to help understand uh, what happened during the meeting. So with a little clumsiness expected, let's see if I can do this. Uh, um, I've also got me up in the corner because people like to see me. It helps them understand what I'm saying. Uh, so this is Decision Making, Pathic Lecture 32. And as an outline, uh, what this presentation is going to be about is decision making as a process versus an event. A decision is an event. Decision making is a process. Uh, examples of conscious decision making, and then addressing unconscious decisions that we make. Uh, how to develop awareness so that you can bring those unconscious decisions to the surface of your consciousness. Spiritual aspects of decision making. And then what the workshop will continue into is some bare bones information on how to use meditation for three voices the nickname of Patrick Lecture 182. The formal name is the process of meditation. Uh, but because it talks about three different voices, uh, it got its nickname. Uh, to differentiate between the ego and the real self. So the idea in this section is to focus on the ego, which makes decisions, and the real self, which is the spiritual core of all of us. Now, next month uh, for February, I'm going to enlarge this. And that's why I put so much effort into this slideshow, because this will work for January. It will also work for February. Because although we're going to be looking at ego versus real self, two voices using the technique, next month we're going to expand into more voices, including the superimposed conscience. So it seemed worthwhile to make an effort to set up two months worth rather than only a single month. So let's see. Uh, so decision-making as a process versus an event. Now I have uh, uploaded all these slides onto my website under Patrick Lecture 32. So I have to go to the tab for the numbers and look for the number that has 32, it's one to 49. And you'll have to go down to 32 to download these slides. Because of that, I'm not going to go through every single one of them. I'm going to describe them because you'll be able to download them and read them and work on them at your leisure. 
this is another thing that happens at workshops is some people say, oh, I got that idea. I, I don't need any more information. And other people are a little confused at, and they need more time with that information. So not knowing who you are and what your studies are and what your level of development is, I'm going to touch on the ideas and then move on. And if you need to look at how I outlined them or what I was trying to say, then you can download the uh, workshop materials, the, uh, this particular PowerPoint presentation from my website. So decision-making is a process versus an event. Decision-making is a starting point. Uh, it's also a willingness to take responsibility for beginning a process. You can't go into the decision-making process if your intention is not to make a decision. That, that's one of those contradictory things that we very often say that it's why we don't get anywhere because we, we said it, but we didn't mean it. We didn't follow up on it. Decision-making is also needs to be an acknowledgement of reality. So when you make a decision, if you're making a decision based on unrealistic factors, you're not going to come to a satisfactory conclusion. If your parameters that you're looking at are not real, then the decision won't be real either. It's an opportunity to explore cause and effect. That's why it's a process. So we say this did that, and then we have to take a look at, did it? And if I repeat it, just like a, a laboratory, in a scientist in a laboratory, um, can I repeat this experiment? Does this always follow that? Or is it intermittent? And therefore I have to look at other factors that could contribute and interfere with the decision, decision that I want to make. It's also an agreement for the process to be conscious. Decision-making is intended to be a conscious process. We make uh, go into it a bit later, we make a lot of decisions without thinking about it. There was some homework done and we dropped it. It just kind of went into the background and the background takes care of it. Just like as I tease people, because I love biology as an example, uh, you don't ask your liver for uh, whether it's going to start working now or whether it wants to wait an hour. The, li the liver makes its own decisions. It's independent. However, it's not independent in the sense that it does whatever it wants. It has parameters that it works within. And as long as it's working within those parameters, you're healthy and you don't notice your liver. You only notice it when it's working outside those parameters, when it's not doing what it's supposed to do or doing too much of what it's supposed to do. So decision-making is an agreement for this process to be conscious. Um, here's another factoid, because I'm, I'm into little trivial facts. There's another factoid that I found out about. For years, people have said uh, that dolphins uh, uh, breathe, uh, have conscious breathing. So if they fall asleep, they'll drown. Well, technically that may be true, but as they've done more studies on dolphins, hopefully kindly to them, I hope it was done kindly, um, what they have found is that dolphins do get to sleep, but their brains are wired differently than ours. They're allowed to have half their brain fall asleep and the other half takes care of the breathing. And then when they switch, one side wakes up, takes care of the breathing, and the other side takes a nap. So while it is true that you, uh, dolphins have to consciously breathe, they don't do that without sleep and without rest. They have a different mechanism than we do. So silly, I, I know, but it's, it's part of an agreement for the process to be conscious, to bring decisions to the surface so that we can interact with them instead of allowing the parameters that we set off years ago, decades ago to continue or parameters that are automatic. A lot of human intuition and instinct is automatic. And we have to step in to interfere with that if it's gotten out of hand. What decision-making is not, it is not about a specific choice. It is not exclusionary, meaning when you make a decision in the decision-making process, it needs to be reversible. You need to be able to make a decision and then adjust the decision. That is the process. Now I have shared many times and a very large number of people nod their heads or agree with me that as a child, uh, I was asked to make decisions. And when I did, that was it. That's what Jan is, that's what Jan likes. And 
It's as if you said, I like dogs and they give you dog presents for the rest of your life. And what that tends to make you do is not make decisions or at least not verbalize the decisions. That's a childhood reaction to other people's limitations. The idea is that we're gonna grow up. We're gonna be more mature than that. We're going to learn to make statements and not expect that they're going to be, we're gonna be held to that all the time. Now, this is something I learned very, very late in life, it is the right to change my mind. The right to say, I did make that decision. I admit I made the decision. I even admit that you developed expectations because of how I made that decision. I need to change my decision, my mind, because of circumstances. I'm sorry it inconveniences you, and I will work to make that inconvenience as small as possible. Whatever I have to do, but I still have the right to change my mind and other people's expectations and the actions they took because of decisions I made are not 100% my responsibility. I have some responsibility. But what I'm speaking of here is getting away from the dualistic, I have all the responsibility for how you took my decision and ran with it. I have some responsibility and it varies from situation to situation. So decision-making is not dualistic or exclusionary and decision-making is not the end of a process. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I didn't make a decision. Well, that's a decision. It's a decision not to make a decision. And when you do that, you put your future your situation in somebody else's hands. I invite you to see that as a ho horrendous, I'm not sure what to use that word. I invite you to see that as a far reaching decision that you make that may be hard to get back. Once you give people the reins to your life, they may not wanna give them back. So it may be quite a, quite a tussle to get certain uh, rights to get certain systems, to get certain elements back in your own hands once you've given them up. But not making a decision is a decision that allows others to maintain or practice active control. It allows the status quo to continue. It also allows us to live in fantasy. When I didn't make the decision, I can play with, well, what if I did this? Or what if I would, maybe it could be this or that because I don't feel responsible for the decision. And I can live in the fantasy of, well, maybe if I make a decision, it'll be this way. You can never know how things would have been. So decision-making is taking responsibility and say, I will make this decision and then I will see what happens. Not what I imagine happens, although I'll want to compare it to my expectations. I will make a decision and see what happens. And if it doesn't work out well, I will remake that decision rather than living in the fantasy. Uh, well, if I'd only had a chance, I would have done this, uh, which allows us to blame others for making decisions for us. You can see the circle there. I didn't make a decision, you made it. So now I blame you for making decisions. It goes on and on and on. Um, so part of decision-making uh, comes down feet on the ground, boots on the ground, comes down to creating and changing habits. And that requires awareness, understanding, effort, and commitment. Now that's where I bring in um, some examples. Uh, this is from entrepreneur.com on how to change habits, three suggestions, I'm going over these fairly quickly. Uh, this is from a CNN article on mindfulness, five different suggestions, uh, creating a gratitude habit from the New York Times, uh, a simple way of developing the habit of being, uh, being gracious, Be creating a habit of expressing gratitude towards someone, something, or to you, using the magic of post-it notes, which is a gift from God, as all things are a gift from God. Uh, so those are all about conscious decisions that you make to change habits. What a big portion of our work is about is addressing decisions we've made that we're not conscious we make. We are not conscious that we have made. So the question becomes, how do you 
address a decision that you don't even know you made. Uh, so what the brain does not see, it cannot process. Uh, and this involves paradigms. Paradigms are a generally uh, accepted set of beliefs. We don't even, uh, we're not even aware of them. You're usually not aware of a paradigm until it's violated. And then you, you just, you can't figure what went wrong because there was such a broad assumption that something wouldn't happen. And then it happens and you don't know quite how to deal with it. Uh, so paradigms, what paradigms do is they reduce a chaotic mass to some form of order. They simplify so that we don't have to think about things all the time. Okay, they're shortcuts. The problem is that once you figure out a shortcut and it works consistently, it just sinks into your unconsciousness and you don't think about it. A very large portion of path work is about images. Uh, images are conclusions you make and you don't even realize you've made them. They operate when you're a child, they sink into your unconsciousness and then you find out that you're still operating from those unconscious images five, six decades later. Uh, so if they work, they're allowed to operate without the involvement of the conscious mind. I tease people a lot. We don't deal with what works. If it works, if it's harmonious, if it's productive and constructive, I don't want to hear about it. Because there's probably a lot in your life that is like that. And hopefully that's the conversations you'll have with friends and relatives. What I work on with people are places that are disharmonious, deconstructive or unconstructive, places that are disharmonious and cause pain. And in those places, these shortcuts may not work anymore, but since we don't know we're operating under them, we don't know how to change them. Uh, par why paradigms are useful. So this is an exercise I got from the University of Hawaii. And it says, try and focus for a minute on the sensory input in the room where you are now. Now you can do this later at your own time. It's an example of an exercise that I find that I find useful. Uh, and listen to all the input. If you take that and you listen for two, three minutes to all the input that's going on, including smells and tastes, even the taste of your own mouth, how does your mouth taste? It may not taste negative or positive, that's still a taste. A smell may not be positive or remind you of anything, but it's very hard to have absolutely neutral, no smell environments. So the idea is that when you look at all this stuff, you can't hold this in your brain. You have to ignore some of them. And that's where paradigms come in handy. So paradigms allow us to throw out the stuff that doesn't matter. It does not matter what my mouth tastes like at the moment. I'll wait till something goes in it and then I'll decide whether I like it or I don't like it. The smell is not a problem unless it's negative or perhaps positive and intrigues me. So the idea is that I just ignore certain sensory input unless it raises its hand, causes a problem or catches my conscious attention. These become paradigms. To make sense of the world, we have to simplify it to a level that our brains can deal with it. So our brains decode what information is important and what can be ignored. And we're not fully conscious of what that process is. Uh, it can be personal, it can be cultural. Uh, you could have various paradigms. Uh, they affect the types of questions we ask because if we have a paradigm that that doesn't matter, we won't ask the question. Um, we go on autopilot so that we don't overburden the brain with trivialities. Uh, and these are, these are like filters. So we're filtering all the information that we're getting. Uh, so on this particular site, they had a quote by Groucho Marx. Time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. Now, you'll have to think about that perhaps. But he's using the word flies in two completely different contexts. And when you put those contexts together, it's jarring, okay? Flies and fruit, it, 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 your brain goes a little wonky. Uh, so you've probably seen this where people use the word, the letter seven in front of the word seven, and we get it. 
they put the letter five in front of the word five instead of the F, we get it even is a replacement for an S in smell. And we get it, we can jump over that. There's a little part of our mind that says something's not right there, but we jump over it anyway. Uh, sociological paradigms, what foods are appropriate for breakfast? If someone served you something that you did not feel was appropriate, it's an unwritten law. You don't do that for breakfast. Others of us do, but we all have our different paradigms. Uh, a question was, how hungry would you have to be before you ate a pet? It, it jars us. We're, we're not used to thinking of satisfying our hunger with the family pet. Uh, what clothing is it appropriate to wear at school is an invisible presumption that we make until somebody shows up in their pajamas or in a bikini. Um, and the famous example is the book Flatland by Edwin Abbott. I use it a lot in my work where if you're a two-dimensional being, you don't develop the words for up and down because up and down don't exist in your word, world. If they do occur in your world, you may not be able to recognize it. You don't have a place in your brain to put that activity. You can't invent the wheel suddenly. It just flashes right past you and you, you re-understand it based on two dimensions. It's a very good analogy for a, the thinking process and especially in uh, moving from the earth plane to spiritual work where things operate a little bit differently. Uh, so changing unconscious beliefs requires awareness, understanding, and making a decision to change them. Uh, this is a list of beliefs that we may have learned in school that may be operating in your daily lives. I invite you to look at this later and see where these beliefs are still present for you even though they were designed for a specific environment, we carry them, not only you and I, but a very large percentage of people carry these school or childhood experiences into their professions, into their lives, into the families they create. And they may not be aware of them. This is another list of them. Uh, so examples of unconscious decisions that we make. Uh, I like using the physical example of blind spots, and it's called the filling in phenomenon. Uh, both eyes have a blind spot, it's a phobia, and it's where the optic nerve comes into the eye. And in that place, there's no uh, rods or cones, which is what we see with. It's, it's a little blank spot. And if you've ever had an extensive uh, optometry exam, uh, they will give you one of the tests that I'm going to show you because certain illnesses of the eye, diseases of the eye, uh, happen because the phobia is enlarging or the retina is detaching. And you catch that by the blind spot being much bigger than it uh, should be, bigger than the norm, okay? Now, why don't we notice that? Because we have binocular vision. And as I move my head even slightly, from moment to moment, and we're never still. If I move my head slightly from side to side as I live, uh, one eye makes up for what the other one doesn't see. So the only way to see the phobia and the effect of the blind spot is this little test. Now, you may not be at the right place in your screen to see this. So the instructions say you should be so far away and you look at the one and you cover an eye. And what you're looking for is the place where the dot or the cross, depending on which side you're looking at, disappears. But it will only happen if you cover one eye. It's a fascinating experiment for you to experience the fact that you've got a blind spot in each eye and you never notice it. And that's because the brain paints in what ought to be there. The brain knows that the wall and the ceiling exist. So if there's a little gap there, it just brushes through it like touch-up artists. The brain is a great touch-up artist. Uh, I included three of them because the effects are different for different people. Uh, you may see the effect on one and not the other. Uh, so physical blind spots, binocular vision will fix that. So one of the ways we get biological feedback is the concept of proprioception. And that is that your inner ear, your balance system and a large, your, your body because of gravity kind of knows where it is in terms of 
of space. I know when I'm leaning over, I can feel the pull on me. My ears give me information. My organs that are pulled to one side give me information. Uh, and my musculature may give me information. So we have, we have a means to tell us that something's not right. Um, uh, psychological and spiritual blind spots can also be realized. And the, one of the, some of the ways to do that, it's not the full list, it's never the full list, is you can listen to feedback from others. So if I have a psychological blind spot where I just can't see something, listening to my friend or my neighbor or my relatives or my loved one can fill in that blind spot and they can say, you never see so-and-so do this. You just never see them. For instance, if somebody was a kleptomaniac and they were constantly sealing things and you had a blind spot against sealing, seeing negativity in somebody you loved, you might blank out what you see or reinterpret what you see. It might take someone else to bring to your attention. Didn't you see them shoplift? Didn't you see them steal that item? Um, another way to overcome psychological and spiritual blind spots is to connect the dots, to look at cause and effect, to become more realistic about every time I do this, that happens. There may be a connection there. I love the phrase connecting the dots. Um, and then there is the internal feedback through development of an observer self. My capacity to step out of my forcing current and get a slightly different once again, like binocular vision, get a slightly different aspect on what is going on. Now, Susan Thesenga wrote a book called The Undefended Self and The Observer Self is chapter three. And she has with very great kindness and graciousness allowed me to put that on my website so it can be downloaded because it's really a, a, a brilliant examination of that process. Uh, it may be that the word observer self doesn't work for you. You may have to think of it differently depending on, on what, the background that you come from. But for example, in the observer self, I am using it now because as I'm speaking, I'm trying to stay on topic and I'm trying to get through the slides and not talk too much. I have a part of me that is listening. A part of me that is saying things are good. Th things are going well. Yes, this is what you plan to do that might alert me when I was going on too long on a, on a specific point. Um, I have a habit of speaking junk, just garbage, just mangled word salad sometimes. And I can hear it. And that's a little bit of my observer self saying, you'd better repeat that one. That one didn't fly. So depending on how you describe it, this is an aspect of us that observes our activity as we are acting. And the observer self is a handy phrase for that. And developing that will keep you from being tripped up by psychological and spiritual blind spots. Um, one of the biggest blind spots to self-development is the ego. Uh, and Pathwork encourages the development of a strong and healthy ego, which is unusual. A lot of new age uh, studies, a lot of Eastern religious practices do not encourage the development of a strong ego. So it's a distinction between pathwork and other spiritual studies. The idea is that a strong and healthy ego knows its place. It understands there's a bigger spiritual reality and that it's not there. So it understands there's a bigger reality. A healthy ego chooses to accept life. People get hung up on that. Accepting life does not mean approving of life. It does not mean you're happy. It means you accept what is. Um, I accept the temperature in the room, or I need to get up and do something about it, or wear more clothing. I have to, it is important for my ego to say, if I can't accept what's going on, I need to create some changes so that it works for me. Um, a healthy ego does want to understand itself, and it chooses to do so. It seeks to integrate itself with its own divine consciousness. Now, these are not separate per se, but it is useful, just like in biology, you can talk about the hand, but that hand doesn't really matter much if it's severed from the body. It's a, uh, it's a thing to study, but it's not what it's meant to be. It's not an organic moving thing once it's separated from the body. The ego cannot be separated from divine consciousness. 
but the ego is an aspect of the divine consciousness that specifically manifests for earthly chores. So a healthy ego does try to move out into real life as the real self with the real self, with the awareness of divine consciousness so that it's integrating divine consciousness into the decisions it makes. Um, creating and changing spiritual habits, no different than changing other habits, which is why I included all that other information. That's about not uh, biting your nails or getting up earlier, but it, it's still useful for any other decision you make. So I like using very practical uh, three to five point examples of things and then modifying it for other things that I wish to do. Um, spiritual decisions are made by the real self. Now, at some point this became way too long, so I just had to truncate. If you want to know more about the real self, I invite you to read more of the lecture materials. The real self represents me as an individual, not the entire spirit world and not perfection, but me as a spiritual being imperfect and here to develop myself. So spiritual decisions are made by the real self. They are enacted through the functions of the ego. And I have found this chart on the ego. This comes from Patrick lecture 132, function of the ego, and also from Patrick lecture 199, ego tricks. And if you look at the ego side, it's very straightforward and simple. And there's a mistake we can make by derogating this, but it, it's important to memorize. It's important to learn. C collecting creative knowledge, repeating and copying is how we make sure we got the instructions right so we'll get where we're going. To remember, to sort out, to select, to make up the mind, to move in a certain direction. And the last one is that the ego can die. Why? It's part of the earth plane. There is no ego per se, according to Pathwork teachings, in the spirit world. We are our real selves in the spirit world. The ego is like our body, what we use to move around on the planet earth. What the ego cannot do and the real self can. Real deep feelings come from the real self. The ego can pretend it can exaggerate, it can emote, but real feelings come from the real self. Deep experiences, giving a deep flavor to living. The ego can mimic this. That's one of its functions is to mimic, to repeat and to copy, but it doesn't generate this deep feeling. To be creative and spontaneous. Well, the ego needs to grab the pen and get the paper and create the space where you have time to do your art. But the actual artistry comes from the real self. And that's the difference between flat paintings that are just representations of uh, versus something that stirs us. Uh, the definition of art is, I don't know what it is, but I can recognize it when I see it. It moves us. It has an effect on us that we can't always name although we, the ego does try to name it. And sometimes it tries too hard, tries to pin it down and make it simple so it can copy it. But that's not art, the copy is not art. Uh, the real self reconciles apparent opposites. The ego gets hung up in apparent opposites. Um, the ego, the real self always has solutions, meaning that there's always something that can be done whether the ego likes it or not, whether it's pleasant or not, that, that's, that's not a factor of, there is something that can be done. Uh, it renders man more alive and fulfilled and the real self continues back into the world of spirit. Now, I went into that because in the workshop we're going to move into working with the ego and the real self. So at some point we needed to know what what actions indicate that the ego is speaking versus the real self is speaking? Um, so the, the mind can imagine all the functions on the real self side of the equation. 
And the ego may believe it is moving in life already as the real self. And the ego starts to try to take over all the decision-making processes. Uh, so I wanted to bring a reminder here of the four stages of spiritual evolution, which is outlined in Patrick Lecture 127, which is automatic reflex, which is lack of conscious awareness. You can't work there. Then you have awareness. And awareness leads us to seek understanding, which leads us to seek greater awareness. And this goes back and forth and back and forth until we are able to drop into a knowing. Knowing's hard to define, but you know it when you hear it. Um, I invite people to look at these examples uh, in areas in your life where things go well, where you didn't realize what needed to be done, you realized what needed to be done, you understood the mechanism, you corrected it, and it's as if it goes into unconscious thinking again, and it does, but because of a knowing, it doesn't go as deeply. So you can bring knowing back up, adjust it, new circumstances, and let it go again. If you look at these four stages of spiritual evolution in the areas where they happen 20 times a day, then you can start looking at where you get hung up on the awareness because we're resistant to the awareness. We may be resistant to the understanding because it challenges us. It changes how we've been thinking and we don't wanna change. This is the ego, you can probably hear it. I don't want to. The real self wants to understand and wants to know that is its life flow. But the ego feels that it is invested and it deals with the qualities of pride, self, will, and fear. I'll look stupid if I change my mind. Maybe you are stupid, but looking stupid is not stupid. And sometimes trying not to look stupid is the stupid part. So I have found this lecture extremely valuable in looking at where we get hung up and what the process is, but it's not one, two, three, four, unless there's no resistance and then it can drop through very easily. Um, one of the examples, two of the examples that I bring up is, um, well, now that I think of it, three, when you learn to ride a bicycle, you have to figure out what balance is. Nobody knows balance on two wheels until they've tried to ride a bicycle. It's, we aren't bicycles, so we have to learn something. And then we struggle with it. And then at some point you get it. And once you get it, you know how to compensate when that balance is threatened. Another example is driving a car, which is much more complicated. And at some point, if you succeed in learning how to drive a car, you may at some point realize I got from here to there and I wasn't even thinking about it consciously the entire way. That's not automatic reflex, lack of conscious awareness. That's a matter of having mastered a complex series of feedback mechanisms so that to, to some extent you only wake up when something interrupts the natural and normal flow of events. Uh, the third example I was thinking of was learning your way around the city. It's confusing at first and then you, you, you get, you have an awareness and you put the pieces together and then you understand the avenues and you understand where they meet and, and you understand this landmark means this. And at some point, no matter where you live, you become comfortable, you become uh, aware, there's a knowing very often of where you are in that town or city. Um, once again, I encourage you to think in terms of innocent uses of this. Because when we move into areas where we are resistant, uh, it's just not as easy. So it's as if we need to practice over here where it's easy, and then we bring it to the difficult part. Uh, creating and changing spiritual habits involves the same process as regular habits, awareness, understanding, effort, and commitment. Um, part of this is to become aware of your current beliefs. That's a whole different process, but I wanted to put it in here because it's important to understand what you believe. You may never have verbalized what you believe. So you can think you believe one thing when your actions and behavior indicate you believe something completely different. Um, so uh, in the lecture, there is an example of, it's a challenge by the guide. Can you decide to believe that all things work together for good? Now. 
people read this and they immediately read it as everything happens, everything that happens is good. It's not what it says. All things work together for good. And the guide is trying to make a few sentences at a time. Sometimes he does expand and it turns into a sentence that lasts a paragraph. So it's, it's, <laughs> You have to forgive him when he tries to say things in shorter sentences because he's simplifying. So that all things work together for good does not include the timeline. All things may work together for the good over a 20 year period. And humans are very often not happy with that idea. So once again, you can work through this. Um, and this is uh, some suggestions on how to find out what you resist and what you believe. Uh, then I changed over to find your resistance to believing that all things work together for good and gave some examples of things that you can try. Uh, and then I wanna move into the idea of using meditation for three chairs, which is Patrick lecture 182. It's a process for differentiating between the voice of the ego and the voice of our inner divine knowing. Uh, uh, it, you can make a game out of this. It's good to make a game out of this. It's good to play. So you have uh, spare Spartan chairs, you have rich gold ornate chairs, you have a hobby horse, you have a lovely cushy round place to sit. Uh, you can use chairs, you can use clothing and objects. And the idea is to differentiate between spirit and ego. Now your spirit and your ego are unique. So what expresses those for you may not be what expresses them for somebody else. When I used to do workshops, we would use um, Ikea, pil Ikea pillows. And we would use, they had a big heart with an arrow through it, big fluffy heart and a yellow star. And I don't remember the third one, uh, uh, oh, yellow sun. And then the third one was a blue star. Now that doesn't necessarily represent three things. So you have to name it. This is what it represents. But there's something about holding the yellow star that usually stood in for the real self and then putting that down and holding something that represented emotion that assists us in finding different aspects of ourselves. So because I'm doing this workshop online, I thought, well, number one, we're going to keep this one down to two items. So I thought of using objects. Now, there are objects that connect you to your spiritual source. And there are objects that connect you to your ego identity. And the easiest thing I could figure out was a phone and a lit candle. Cliches, yes, but they'll work. Okay. And then you hold one versus the other. And the idea is to speak in the voice of the ego versus the voice of the spiritual self. Now, I can't really demo well during this presentation. Um, but I'll give you a for instance. If I go into demo, I'll uh, I change gears, and then it's hard for me to get back out again. Um, what is the voice of the ego? It says, "I am this person, and I do this, and I have this many years of experience, and here are my credentials, and here's here's uh, I, I can tell you why I should be trusted." Perhaps you can hear that those are all ego basis. They're all uh, based on facts. Um, they are, I offer them up because they can't be disputed. Uh, so that's my resume, that, that's, uh, that's my list of things that show that I'm qualified. It's very difficult to prove that I'm spiritually qualified to teach something. That requires a bit more consideration. It requires a little bit, um, it requires a deeper voice within me. And if I can just play with that for a second, what qualifies me to teach this is having done it. I have done the work myself. And what I hope is that I have a partnership with my ego. And this is the goal of the healthy ego, I have a partnership with my ego where my ego is able to verbalize my spiritual experiences and even augment and extend them and say, let's go over to Wikipedia. We can get a good example over there. But the inspiration of that comes from my real self, comes from my desire to be a better person, which is too vague for the ego. It says, well, how do I do that? 
because that's its job to figure out how to do it. So that's a suggestion for using two objects and seeing if you can do this um, on your own or with a partner. Okay, you can notice the different energies that happen. This is an energetic process. That's why it's hard to do in two dimensions of a video presentation. And then you switch back and forth, picking up and putting down. It's important in our real world to pick up a different object and feel into it and then put it down and pick up another object and feel into it. We are um, beings of matter and matter matters. Um, when I was uh, years and years ago, uh, I had, a, there were three of us that were interested in this and we watched videos from the voice dialogue group and then we practiced and we practiced for two hours or so, um, five or six times, we would get together and we would practice and we would trade off. And we would be, one would be the therapist, the other would be the client and the other would be the observer. And we would rotate. And uh, my experience was that it was relatively easy to begin to hear the difference in the voices. Now we do that in ordinary life. Someone might say, you sound just like your mother. Well, you may be carrying at that moment an image in your mind of how your mother approaches things. You may even unconsciously be taking her attitude to promote that. So without vocally sounding like your mother, you may remind people of that energy. You may be sounding like a boss. I've been accused of being bossy because I tend to take a, this is the way it should be done attitude. Uh, they say you, you sound like the boss and you're not the boss. Um, it's an energy and an attitude more so than some of the details. Uh, so I recommend going to Voice uh, Dialogue uh, International and take a look at their videos and manuals uh, and, and see if this is something that appeals to you. So it can be self-taught. Um, and then this is information on the workshop, uh, click, Click to exit, there we go, uh, and stop sharing screen. So um, that's a presentation. Uh, I'm not used to doing PowerPoint, so this has been a revelation to use this tool. Um, it can be helpful. Ultimately, it's about feelings. It's about what we're doing. It's about uh, a lot of aspects of us that are not easy to verbalize. But the ego needs something to take away. The ego needs handouts so it can sit down and study it later. Uh, so that's part of my goal is to give you something to work with. And you know, feel free, one page, one page out of 45 may work for you. I want to thank you if you're still here for bearing with me. It's been a bit of a long presentation. Um, and I hope you'll take a look at Patrick Lecture 32 on decision making, Patrick Lecture 182 on the process of meditation or meditation for three voices. Uh, my goal is to promote reading and study of Patrick materials, but spiritual evolution in general, no matter how you do it. So thanks very much, take care.